So first of all, I would just like to say thank you to all of you for showing up, and thank you to Udo, to Lynn, to everybody who's put the effort and energy into uh, creating today and this opportunity to come and discuss this very important topic. And what I would just like to say is I'm here to present my ideas. I have this talk uh, called Realizing Regenerative Futures from Cyborg Trees to Smarter, Greener Cities. But I'm also here to learn from you. So what I would like to encourage you to do, I know there's many students in the audience, also many of you who are experts in this area, please ask me questions, please challenge what I'm saying today, or please comment on things so that I can start to rethink this situation. Because what I would actually like to accomplish today is to start a discussion and frame my own talk with these questions, but potentially also frame the discussion that we're having today around these questions. So, you know, the title of the day is Cyborg Landscapes, but I'm going to sort of narrow in on smart urban nature or smart natures. And what I'd like you to take with you today is to, to think about what is smart nature and who governs it? Which visions of the future are presented and for whom? Which, uh, whose sustainability gets prioritized in these landscapes? And how do we balance the drive for resource optimization with the imperative of justice and equity? And I hope these are questions that resonate through the rest of the day. And I'd like to situate this talk in a context that I, I would assume many of us are familiar with, which is the SDGs, right? The United Nations Sustainability Goals, which we're supposed to achieve by 2030. And in this context, cities are spoken of as sites of environmental degradation, of crisis, of uncertainty, but also as sites of environmental solutions and innovation, which is incredibly important given the kind of wicked nexus that we're situated in today with our climate crisis, our biodiversity crisis, and increasing socioeconomic inequity, and the impending governance crisis that that brings forth. So we're, dem oops, here we go. So we're being asked as landscape planners, managers, students of this area, scholars of this area, to think holistically, right? To think across silos and to start realizing social and ecological resilience for climate resilience in urban contexts, not only across social and ecological solutions, but also across urban or digital spheres as well. So how do we start to kind of optimize many of these opportunities? And here, urban nature is in strong focus. And why is that? Well, policymakers understand in many ways the multifunctional benefits of urban nature. And when I'm speaking to urban nature, what I'm speaking to are street trees, trees in parks, parks, community gardens, informal green spaces, very formal green spaces, from the small to the large, and also blue areas, like the river that runs through Freising. And what's important about this kind of infrastructure, you could say, is that it's multifunctional. And even in times of uncertainty or kind of crises, it continues to provide co-benefits around uh, increased air quality, increased stormwater management, increased social cohesion, increased human health and well-being. So in many ways, green infrastructure is kind of seen as this silver bullet, right? It can do everything. But it's not enough. In the eyes of policymakers, it needs to be optimized, right? And this is where the green smart city, or the optimized clean and green city comes into the picture. And what are we talking about here? Well, policymakers are not only encouraging us to think in terms of computational optimization with urban governance, but to also understand how we can optimize resilience. And what does this look like? Uh, I think the clicker might have pointed there. Okay, good. So what does this look like in reality? Well, how many of you have ever seen or used a lawnmower that's a robot? 
These are quite common in Denmark. Maybe Germans like to actually mow the lawn. Uh, but the idea is that we can save time, right? Why go outside and push around a lawnmower when you can buy a robot, you can drink your coffee, and you can watch the lawn being mowed, right? Um, but as researchers, as students, how many of you have your phone with you today? Right? Everybody's got a phone. So there's, an, there's a shortcut here to collecting data. All of us are kind of data nodes. We're walking around and constantly sensing and being sensed by those who own the data. But we can also use our smartphones to collect data, right? To optimize tree collection, urban tree inventories, to optimize biodiversity inventories through gaming or sort of creative understandings of how we can interact with our phone. Many of you have maybe used iNatura. We can go out and identify species when you're walking, take pictures, and then share those pictures with others. Many of us have used creative gaming to kind of understand how we optimize these resources. So in many ways, you know, these, these sort of smart city tactics are already in play. Yet more recently, the smart city has taken on a new mission, namely saving the climate or saving us from climate destruction. There's a call by big tech and leading researchers to harness the technological advances of AI, the speed, the scale, and the computing power to provide solutions not only to stopping climate change, but to adapting climate change. So the promise is that open source data around urban nature, urban phenomenon, all of the data that we have, can be synthesized into mega data, providing us with much more precise ideas of where climate risks are clustered and how we potentially can not only stop those risks, but adapt our urban environments to those risks. So in this particular project that's been recently funded by uh, Google AI challenge, climate challenge, and uh, is going to be run by some elite urban ecologists. Uh, what we're looking at is that sort of the scale and the speed and the computational power of these models will provide us with an optimized opportunity to harness the power of AI. And the idea is that in times of inconsistency and uncertainty, we can provide more certainty with technology. Technological advances are not only being used to manage urban futures through data, through financing, through policy decisions, but also to generate visions of future landscapes regarding what is good, what is the good life. This particular image was made for a competition using generative AI to speak to social and ecological resilient futures. But, oh, sorry, there we go. This is the image. Um, but what I find fascinating is that the image was generated using scraped data from images made by artists whose intellectual property generated this particular vision of a good future. This appropriation of data, of artistic license and intellectual property warrants serious discussions regarding generative futures and future smart landscapes. Questions that we wanna be asking are, which data are these visions based on and for which end? And who or what is absent from this image and other seductive images using generative AI? These technologies that I've shown so far are driven by aims of productivity and profitability, but also creativity and innovation to provide smart and real solutions to pressing environmental challenges. But taken together, they present some really rapid uh, and rapid technological developments that are potentially disruptive, not only to the management and planning of urban nature, but to the management and planning of our futures. And so we've kind of come to a moment here in society where we're very, very interested in the impacts of AI. How will it impact ourselves as people? How will it impact our governments? How does it impact democracy? But the challenge that I would like to bring to us is if we think about these questions of transparency, who owns our data? What do we know about the algorithms that are controlling our data? And what sort of futures do they provide for us? 
I think the key question for today is, at this moment, does AI and these kind of technological developments provide us with an opportunity to harness the benefits for social and ecological resilience, or do we see a future of degradation? These are not new questions for landscape architects or managers. I mean, in many ways, the field of landscape architecture is about responding to change and how do we plan for change in landscapes. And in this regard, data and how data plays into landscapes and landscapes ma landscape management has been a field of fascination for scholars for many years. Udo, you walked us through your own journey. Here in this slide, I'm speaking to research that's been done by researchers at Harvard and the University of Virginia, thinking about responsive landscapes, not only at the urban scale, but actually at the global scale. So moving from local data points and how data can help us understand change in landscape through positive or negative impacts to broader planetary scales, thinking about smart earth. And one example of that is this idea of the internet of trees. How many of you have heard of this? Okay, so we saw some really inspiring pictures of forests and what technology and forestry have to do with each other. But it's actually not science fiction and it's not just art. I mean, in a time of uh, widespread destruction, deforestation, climate crisis, and biodiversity crisis, we actually see a huge push to proliferate technology and landscapes for very positive means and impact. So here what we talk about with the Internet of Trees is the web of sensors, of drones, of LDAR or satellites, satellite images that are reflecting back changes in forestry, not only at the urban scale, but at the planetary scale, that help us understand, manage, and in many ways kind of drive sustainable forestry. And this is all very positive. It's proliferating at a very rapid rate. And you know, lots of cities have what we call a digital twin of all of their urban trees in order to start to create synthetic data to understand what will climate change do to impact forestry moving forward. This is all very important work. Yet we have the opportunity to ask some critical questions here. Because as our landscapes become datafied, you could say, we're creating new social and political implications that are under-researched and understood, under-understood. So it's our opportunity as students, practitioners, scholars, to really dig into these landscapes and to start asking important questions about what kind of imaginaries are presented, what kind of governance implications do we have here, whose visions are understood, which risks and consequences opportunities unfold in these situations. So what I would like to do is walk you through some anecdotes of these kind of technological interventions and then discuss uh, some of the consequences and some of the opportunities associated with them. So urban food production. This is a huge topic, specifically, specifically in the context of nature-based solutions. Right? So poverty, urban food deserts, uh, the kind of land use management around food is huge in terms of how we actually realize sustainable and resilient pathways moving forward. And entrepreneurs have not been blind to this. So in densely populated urban centers from Japan to the United States to Europe, we see a lot of innovation in this area with vertical urban farming. What happens in vertical urban farming? Well, you don't need sunlight, and you don't need soil, and you don't need people, per se. You need somebody to own a structure, and you need some equipment put in. But then you have robots and sensors and artificial intelligence doing the rest of the work. What comes out of this is microgreens and mushrooms. So obviously not food that can feed the planet, but a really interesting opportunity to think about how food production can be optimized and also protected in many ways, given the kind of urban shocks that we see. And given the crisis in Ukraine, where we have impending food shortages, 
on a global scale, there's an opportunity to think here about supply and demand and new ways of realizing that. So technology has many promises in this field. Human well-being is another hot topic, right? We know that we have all sorts of crises. Another crisis is sort of our own well-being, our psychological well-being, but also our physical well-being. And here we have the opportunity, many of us potentially have smartwatches to begin with or track our own sort of steps or exercise patterns with our phones. And this data is being used not only in a personal sense but also in a planning sense to understand the opportunities for increased well-being and for increased revitalization in urban environments. So one example is the city of Oakland where youth and the entire population is dis disproportionately impacted by air pollution, by environmental toxins, by food deserts, by a lack of good infrastructure to move around and the ability to sort of move without the danger of the car. So scientists at the University of California in Berkeley have been looking at the opportunity to engage children in tracking their mobility and moving around for sort of positive benefit. Where would, they, where would they like to move? How would they like to move? And what sort of uh, experience do they get out of it, right? So what's the emotive experience as well? So there's a great opportunity here to tap into personal motivation and also looking at how we can provide new infrastructure to provide children and youth with agency to move around and to experience health and well-being in new ways. In addition, we also get a lot of data around toxins, particulates, uh, data, real-time data that informs policymakers about these red zones or the actual dangers of air pollution and how they impact individuals. If it's not collected, it doesn't matter to policymakers. So having this kind of data is actually extremely important and can have big impacts. So moving on to Australia, <laughs> um, urban nature stewardship is another very hot topic. So we can realize urban nature, we can support it, but how do we take care of it? And specifically, how do we take care of it given the kind of drastic changes in climate that have occurred specifically in the city of Melbourne over the last 40 years where they've suffered long-term droughts that have adversely impacted the very lush urban forest. Melbourne is known as a garden city with this kind of Victorian legacy of huge street trees, elms, uh, oaks, all sorts of beautiful European trees that shade the city and protect people from heat. But in 2009, uh, scientists, urban ecologists, and policymakers realized that if they didn't act on the forest, within five years, 10% of the forest would be dead. In 20 years, 40% of the urban forest would be dead, et cetera. And it was worth a lot of money, right? So in this inventory exercise, what they actually realized is that they had an opportunity to engage residents, not only in social learning, but also in stewardship of the urban forest. And they did this in a very innovative twist already back in 2011, 2012, by creating what they call the urban forest visual. And if you're not familiar with this map, I would encourage all of you to look it up. If you get bored during my talk, you can look at it right now. Um, but what's exciting about it is that as a resident, you can go in and you can figure out which trees are doing well, which trees are not doing well. You can even write an email to a tree. Right? And so what came out of this is beautiful data that really shows that very strong emotional attention uh, and attachment that all of us have to a tree that we like or urban nature that we appreciate. Once again, that is not the information that politicians usually get, but if you have that on hand as an urban forestry manager, you can then deliver that to your politicians and say, this is why we invest in forests. Right? And you can also sh take it on to citizens and help them realize why it's really important to do the kind of care work for the trees that they already want to be doing. So it's kind of a way of real-time stewardship, real-time realization of that input and value.
other exciting frontiers to consider. We are in a biodiversity crisis. How do we actually give agency to the more than human in this political moment? How do we hear the voice of nature? Well, scientists have been thinking about this for a long time. But recently, Karen Bakker, who unfortunately passed away this summer but was a brilliant, brilliant geographer at the University of British Columbia, has been working with bioacoustics over the last 10 years and gathering information, working with computer scientists, working with planners, working with indigenous groups in British Columbia to understand how do we start to decode the voice of nature and what happens if we intentionally listen to nature? What do we learn? And her knowledge actually influenced in many ways this incredible project, which all of you should look up now or later, called the SETI Project, recently featured in The New Yorker under a title, Can We Talk to Whales? And what's happening here is that scientists from Harvard, MIT, other prestigious universities across computer science, uh, biology, oceanography, are asking, can we actually de decode whaleese, or the language of sperm whales? And why does this matter? Well, what does it mean in a time of increasing ocean temperatures? What are whales actually experiencing? What does it mean when we have constant interactions between uh, boats and whales, where whales get clipped by boat motors? What does it mean when their food sources are critically reduced so that calves are continuously dying and populations are under pressure? Those are the kind of stories that we could hear if we understood the language of whales. And this logic extends to trees. What happens when you give a voice to nature? What happens when trees become something more than a biophysical entity, but become data, and become data that we actually can understand? These images are from the city of Singapore. How many of you have spent time in Singapore? It's a very exciting place. Many of us stop over there in the airport. I would encourage you to visit as well. It's a small island nation, extremely dense, one of the most dense urban settlements in the whole entire world. And what's incredible is that since the 1960s, Singapore has been focusing on technological approaches to cleaning and greening the island while maintaining the biophysical mass of jungle that is there. So despite the density, 52% of the island is covered by biophysical green, right? So it's really an incredible place to visit. Yet, of course, there's tensions. And Udo, you mentioned the title of my book, Street Fights in Copenhagen. And what that refers to is the kind of fight for space and the fight for commodities and resources and attention. And the story in Singapore that's quite interesting here is that if we look at one side of the, the slide, we see a traditional kapong. And this was the kind of settlement that people lived in before uh, the post-war years. And in a kapong, you were self-sustaining. You had your animals, which lived under the house. You had your trees, which provided you with fuel, also resources to mend your house, as well as food. And those extended from generation to generation. In addition, you had small agricultural practices. Right? What happened after the war in Singapore is that as this small island became a nation state, they realized that they needed to rapidly transform the quality of life, but also the infrastructure of the island to realize economic sovereignty. And that had trade-offs, one of which is that everybody lives in high-rises today, so the kapong is a thing of the past, but also that many of the luscious jungle spaces have been converted into Ika's sort of versions of commodified nature. So Gardens by the Bay is the, one of the most visited sites in Singapore, and that's the uh, vision that we see on the other side of the slide. And this is what I call the cyborg tree. So instead of having sort of lush jungle, we now have um, 100 meter cement pillars with steel uh, fronds, which then have sort of sensors and for water, for air, and for regenerating actually the energy and feeding it back into the grid. And these, these trees don't necessarily give us a lot of information, but they're one of the most geotagged 
images of Singapore. So if we go into Instagram and start to look at the hashtags and understand what people think about these trees, we see a whole new kind of reality associated with these trees, moving beyond the structure to a sort of cyborg experience and an interaction with that. And questions around which nature counts become extremely relevant. Is it the nature that pays the rent, or is it the nature that provides sustenance? These questions are taken up by scholars, Karen Bakker, who I mentioned before, but Jennifer Gabrys, who's at Cambridge and working on the Smart Forest Project, extend this kind of datification of smart natures, or urban natures, from the urban to the global scope. And we can all look forward to Karen's next book that's coming out with MIT Press in January 2024, thinking about Gaia's web, or the Smart Earth Project, planetary governance. What does it look like when it's datafied? And what opportunities and risks are involved in these so-called cyborg landscapes? And what kind of autonomy can be given and voice can be given to nature in these contexts? What I hope has come through in these examples is that smart natures are not just technological interventions or infrastructure but they're a confluence of social, ecological, and technological couplings or systems. And this is a framework um, constructed by Tymon McPherson, one of my colleagues, an urban ecologist at the New School. And what he posits is that in the science of cities, in the datification of cities, we have to move beyond silos. We need to think about the interactions between the social, the ecological, and the technological, specifically when we're thinking through the risks and opportunities associated with smart natures. So that's what I'll invite us to do now. So what are the opportunities and risks associated with urban food production that becomes uh, commodified and becomes automated? Well, in one regard, we might see higher yields of a certain type of crop. We might also be shielded from the kind of, as I said, shocks of, of climate change. But on the other hand, we'll very much miss that kind of ecological connection that we have the soil and also our ecological memory. How many of your grandparents grew up on farms? How many of you grew up on farms? Right, so not that many of us actually know how to grow food longer. Right? And this is important. And if the cautionary tale of Monsanto can help us understand the situation, when this kind of practice gets commodified and owned by one certain entity, we can risk losing a lot, not only about cultural identity, but also about our right to produce our future. What are the opportunities and risks associated with social and the technological context? So if we think about health and wellness and kind of humans as sensors, we have great opportunities to tap into our understanding of place, our very specific contextual understanding, which is very important in a planning context. Yet we also risk issues of privacy and exploitation around surveillance, but also, if we're thinking about issues of insurance and health and well-being, we can then start to sort of punish certain people that might be, uh, you know, that might be seen as unhealthy or not worth paying for in this kind of datafied health and wellness industry. So there's tensions there specifically around youth and youth futures. Does everybody have the right to equal health care in the future? I would suggest yes. What are the opportunities and risks associated with algorithmic governance, right? When we're thinking about the opportunities of doing real-time stewardship, real-time social learning, we have a host of tools at our hands, and we know this is incredibly important to unlock financing, to unlock implementation, to unlock impact in social learning. Yet at the same time, we risk um, this kind of idea of um, the digital apartheid, right? Many of us know people who don't have access to online platforms, who maybe don't feel comfortable using these online tools, or maybe who actually reject it for different reasons. That causes problems. And not everybody's voice is heard equally in these digital 
uh, chambers. Some are much louder than others. How do we approach that? How do we deal with that? I think these are important questions that we need to take moving forward. And of course, the ultimate question is who owns the data? In the city of Melbourne, we're talking about open source data. Any of us can go in as students or scientists, ask for their data and look at it and work from it, learn from it. Citizens can do that as well. But this is certainly not the case in other algorithmic governance contexts. And that's something that we need to be aware of. What are the opportunities and risks of multi-species engagement? Well, I spoke, hopefully convincingly, of the importance of decoding the voice of nature. Yet, we should also consider that there are many species who might not want to be understood. Why would they want to have a conversation with us, right? Uh, the other thing to consider is what happens when we do start to understand. Do we abuse that power? What is the, what is the relationship of exchange? And how do we then afford the more than human agency and decision-making processes. And all of these examples bring us back to the title of today, Cyborg Landscapes, where we see that not only do we have this code and space and continuous interaction between our imagination, reality, the datafied, the physical, the natural, the unnatural, the culturally generated, but we have a bounded context based on our political situations. And this is, in many ways, the work that I've been engaged with over the last six years, is thinking about what are the rules of the game in these different scenarios, right? So listening to the more than human in one context could afford really positive outputs, whereas and in another, it could become very exploitative. So we have to start thinking about the way in which power is allocated who owns the data? What kind of context we're thinking about in terms of decision making? Who's given agency? And how is that agency actually used? More data is not always better data. We have to think about quality of data and who owns that data and who benefits from that. So now I'd like to walk you through the results of a research study that we just completed here in August to bring you back to kind of an everyday reality. Right? So for the last three years, I've been working in a research project funded by the Nordic uh, Council of Ministers and uh, together with the Stockholm Resilience Center, University of Helsinki, and the New School in New York, we were thinking about how we could adapt this kind of understanding of the smart city with nature-based solutions. So if our challenge is to think in an integrated context, yet to also use digital tools and digital advancement, while we're doing that, how does that look put together? And specifically, what does it look like in a Nordic context? And so we used three case sites. Copenhagen, where I was leading our project. Uh, we had a case site in Helsinki and also a case site in Stockholm. And here we engage that social, ecological, and technological systems network to start to think through these couplings. So in Stockholm, we were very interested in the voice of nature and what does that mean for environmental management. In Helsinki, we were very interested in human health and well-being and what that means for the optimization of green spaces. And in Copenhagen, we were very interested in aspects of justice and care and representation in the Green City Agenda. So in Helsinki, the challenge was to think, how can smart technologies in nature-based solutions enhance or hinder the potential for restoration? And for those of you who have been to Helsinki, it's a city in development, right? There's many places that are sort of new, and specifically the neighborhoods that we worked with are these kind of smart city developments that the municipality is working with. So the, the question was, how do we work with this smart city trope and kind of newer green spaces at the intersection of human health and well-being. And so what we did here was actually quite novel. Our project team, our project team in Helsinki worked with a PPGIS, which is mapping through geographical information systems. Individual people were recruited for the study and they were asked to take a walk and to start to map what they liked or disliked about these areas. At the same time, they were wearing a sensor ring, which recorded a bunch of sensory data. So stress levels, how different sounds 
and soundscapes impacted their well-being. And then after the walk, they were able to qualify this by going in and responding to free response questions linked to the points that they mapped. So this interactive, multi-sensory approach gave us a lot of data to help us understand that in many ways what we know to be that certain soundscapes are absolutely not okay for humans, right? And they should be avoided at all cost. And this is important information for policymakers going into the development of these newer areas. How do they then secure the wellness of residents and users of these areas against you know, traffic noise, but also against the noise of kind of urban development itself? So if you're living in a neighborhood in transition, how do you deal with that constant noise, specifically for children? And this is research that uh, is still under um, analysis, but uh, I think will continue to release new and surprising outcomes. So in Copenhagen, we were very much thinking about the challenge of how to design and manage just, safe, and secure cities through smarter technology. 20% of the Danish population lives in not-for-profit housing, and this not-for-profit housing has a circular economic model, meaning that residents pay for the operations of that housing, the operational costs, so it's not market value. Yet many of these so-called welfare landscapes, right, these housing units were all built after the war and have a lot of lawn, a lot of grass, a lot of glass, they're now being adapted for climate change. And so many of these green areas are being dug up. And those operations in and of themselves cost a lot of money to separate stormwater management, uh, stormwater flow from sewer. And those costs are being passed on to residents themselves, which is then impacting the affordability of those housing areas. So what we were tasked with doing was thinking about how smart technologies can actually help us understand people's attachment to these green areas and how those place values could be realized in a broader renovation. This is not an easy access, easy to access population. 60 different nationalities, even more languages spoken. Uh, almost everybody speaks Danish, yet you've got a lot of people doing odd jobs, uh, a lot of kind of unusual context given kind of a research setting. And so what we did is we worked with a local youth who we recruited to go out with an iPad and he ended up speaking to 200 adults or those over the age of 18 about their feelings related to green spaces. And we were able to map over 600 positive points associated with the site. This is incredibly important because architects have now realized the drawings for the structural changes here and Operations will start here already in January to rip up all of these comments. And what we were able to do by mapping these sites is to actually have an impact in terms of policy and design. And happy to share more of those results with you if you're interested in them. These results were then qualified through conversations with people. So we didn't just use a digital approach. We actually went out and talked to people as well because we're very aware of this digital divide, right? Not everybody's heard the same way. In Stockholm, we use sensors in garden beds in the kind of Royal Port area to think about how IoT, or the Internet of Things, can actually unleash the voice of nature. And here, I have to say, we actually kind of flopped. So while we collected a lot of data, and I mean a lot, we couldn't see a difference between these rain beds that we put the sensors into and the other areas. And so we can conclude a few things about that. We can say maybe there's not a difference in terms of how much water is needed or the kind of how weather impacts these areas. Or we could also say that we need much bigger sites because we know those of us who are involved in landscape planning that biodiversity impact doesn't just happen in a single rain bed, it happens across a larger ecosystem. And so this is something that we're continuing to work on, and actually in the smart AI project that I introduced at the very beginning, Tymon McPherson, who is our partner in this project, will continue to work on, albeit at a much larger scale. But what can we learn from this study? Well, I think what happens is when we're contextualizing, once again, those social, ecological, and technological interactions, what we see is that sensing, listening, 
issues of care and justice and empowerment become critical. So going back to some of those first questions that I posed for us in the audience, what is smart urban nature? Who, who owns it? And what kind of futures does it provide for us? And how do we balance issues of optimization with equity and justice? I think we got a lot of answers actually out of this project, that while technology can provide optimization, we actually oftentimes need to slow down. And we need to think about scale in different ways than we've thought about it before. And these are some of the key questions that we're facing right now as a society in terms of AI and its rapid advance. So traditional AI, I'm just gonna break down a few definitions here in my last slides. Traditional AI is often called weak AI, and it focuses on performing a specific task intelligently. So many of us have seen how you know, robot can beat a human in chess, right? This is traditional AI. AI learns the game, they know all the moves, it can synthesize it, and it can be smarter than us. But what's happened recently, and I think many of us have used ChatGPT or some of the large language models that have come out, this is called generative AI. And what generative AI provides us is a massive scale of data. And now we're learning that much of this data has actually been stolen from artists, from scholars, those of us who have our articles online, from people who have written books over the last 100 years. Google wasn't just doing their book project to provide us with uh, books, they were doing it to learn from the books, right? Um, so we have to once again always be sort of skeptical around who owns this data and who does this data. Because the question is, what kind of futures are being authored for us? And do we have an opportunity to engage in those futures? So what I would like to posit is that what we see currently in the AI discussion, and we can talk about this at the smart nature scale, but we can also talk about it at a planetary scale and societal scale, is that there's a lot of hype around what generative AI can do, what kind of ethical guardrails we need to have around it, what's our responsibility, what's their responsibility, how do we regulate it, right? The EU is very active in this front, luckily. But I would like to suggest that we also need to be asking about the regenerative, regenerative potential of AI and technologies. And I'd like to take some time to differentiate between those two terms. So generative AI builds, it generates new things. It can learn without us, right? Which is why if you go into OpenAI or ChatGPT and ask it to do something, it'll just create a poem, it'll create a story because it's learned from all of the data that has been scraped. But if we talk about regenerative practices, we're talking about working within the planetary boundaries. How many of you are familiar with the term planetary boundaries? It's the idea that we don't use more than we already have, right? We can't overshoot. Every year we overshoot, but we aim to pull back and to work within the means that we already have. And not only within the means that we already have, but within the means that actually provide something back to us provide something back to planet, provide something back to people, and provide just and equitable pathways, meaning that we all have opportunities, that we don't leave anybody behind, back to the SDGs, specifically number 11. Now, what does this actually look like in practice? Well, in a very humble sense, I would like to say that we started to scratch the surface in our Smarter Greener Cities project. By working in sort of partnership, right? So as researchers, we were really thinking about we were really thinking about solutions-oriented research through partnerships. So we partnered with a social housing company. We partnered with the architects. We partnered with the utilities company. We partnered with the city, with social workers, with citizen champions, kind of these residents who are always moving and grooving and making things happen. And because this is a very troubled neighborhood, a lot of money was granted by a national housing foundation to kind of deal with this parallel society problem, which is defined by the Danish government. So we were lucky to have financing. We were lucky to have time. We were lucky to have capacity. And we were lucky to work in a really collaborative team environment to think about how these solutions can be realized through technological advances. So long-term collaboration time, money, and capacity. And additionally, we worked across systems and knowledges. Our assumption was that voices on the ground were not being heard, but that actually wasn't true. 
Voices were being heard, but the question was, did anybody care? So we started to think about frameworks of care and how care, a feminist practice of care, which means listening, being reflexive, being open for criticism, being open for uh, disruption, and then being able to integrate that into the process over time, how that actually works over a longer time process. And this brings me to my last two slides. We have a lot of claims to smart nature, planetary governance, and smart Earth moving forward. And they're not always from people who are interested in listening. And so what I would like to encourage all of us to think about is who is authoring our future? What kind of data, what kind of technologies, what kind of natures are, offering, are authoring our future? And we're working within a context of the science of cities, right? We have many policymakers, as I introduced at the beginning, calling for these technological solutions. We have an imperative of urgency. We have to solve things now. At the same time, we have protesters around the world, oftentimes youth, oftentimes people of color, oftentimes people who are marginalized, coming forward and saying, we can't continue to do the things that we've always been doing. We need radical changes. And how these two kind of you know, agendas work together is definitely going to be decided in this technological realm. And all along, we need a politics of hope, right? We need to start thinking if we have Elon Musk and if we have Jeff Bezos on one side concerned with colonizing Mars and not very concerned with us or the materialities of our everyday natures and Earth, we also have radical ecofeminists like Vandana Shiva who is a physicist, who is a prize-winning author, and a brilliant woman in India who has been organizing activists and scientists for over 30 years to give agency to the marginalized and to think about how we can learn from our potential as humans and from our potential of interacting with the Earth to the knowledge that we have had and that we continue to have. And it's these two tensions that are extremely important to pay attention to and yet we also need to pay attention to these stories and narratives of hope. So with that, I would like to thank you so much uh, for listening and just conclude with some final statements, the questions that I brought up again. We need to remember these questions, not only for this lecture, but also for today. And if you're interested in further reading, I have provided some resources as well. So thank you so much for your attention and time. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie, for this uh, inspiring and, uh, how do you say, uh, questioning talk. I mean, there are more questions on the table now than I ever thought. Um, I don't know if we are able to cover that. We have a few minutes for one or two questions before we have a small break. So if anyone feel urgently to ask a question, please, there's the microphone back there. Sadim. Yeah. Thank you very much for this extremely fascinating talk that was both broad and diving deep in specific topics. Um, I was curious if you could share just a few more sentences on, uh, on one point that interests me a lot when you refer to the gardens by the bay and this contrast between the discussions and perceptions of specialists versus those of uh, the broader public. Mm. and then the risk of, and, and opportunities of these uh, smart systems in that context. Great, thanks. So the question was about gardens by the bay in Singapore, yeah. right? Yes. So what's interesting about Singapore is that it's very difficult to kind of hear dissonance. First and foremost, because it's a top-down governance context whereby the city is hyper-professional and they steer everything very tightly and they're really good. I mean, their work is excellent. But what I've done, uh, both through my PhD and my PhD's co-supervisor was actually Singaporean. So I was given access to some kind of unique sources, but also uh, went and visited the National Parks Authority and then spoke with a lot of residents who are doing more grassroots work, is that you realize that just as in any place, there's diverse nature perceptions. So some people are very interested in utilitarian uses of nature albeit gardens by the bay, right? How do we get the most money for our land? And how do we promote what we do in a way that's flashy and 
pretty, Instagrammable. But there are many who fought for that site to be preserved as a wildlife conservation site for the migratory birds who used that site before. And it was a long kind of nasty fight between the Nature Conservancy Agency in Singapore and these developers and the government who ultimately won out. But what my research shows is that this awareness around kind of conservation really took hold in the 90s when citizens started feeling like they had the right to protest and to work intact with kind of this global environmental awareness that came forth with the Rio Convention. Um, so what happens globally impacts Singapore, and in fact what happens in Singapore impacts us as well. Copenhagen sends a delegation over there of urban managers to the Danish Architectural Center every single year. So these kind of exchanges between cities and how they learn from each other resonates globally, which is why I'm so interested in Singapore. Because ultimately the question is, if you commodify nature, which nature counts? doesn't really matter what I think as a, as a person. What we see in this governance context is it matters which nature pays the rent. Yeah. All right, I mean, I'm especially thankful uh, that you introduced a social aspect into this discussion because this is not about, uh, not, not only about technology, not only about ecology, this is a real social challenge we have to deal with, so thanks for doing that.